is recording. All right. Uh... All right. So, hello, everybody. Welcome, or welcome back, depending, uh, to the Raptor's Nest, where we talk about things sometimes. I am your host, Brastator, and I am joined here today. Uh, he is short of stature, and he never touches the stuff. Please put your claws together for Soberdor. Hello, everyone. Alrighty. So, um, for those of you who don't know, um, out of the four of you that are listening, Soberdor uh, specializes in video games. That is his area of expertise, and he has an entire YouTube channel dedicated uh, to game analysis. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that before we get started with the topic? Uh, yeah, I do, as you just got done saying, I do a video game analysis on video game design and video game narratives. Uh, I'm a bit of a game designer, and I took a lot of writing classes uh, because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a video game writer. And I just decided, you know what, I got all this knowledge and information in my head. Why don't I just start teaching other people about it? And that's kind of where the channel came from. All right. Sounds good. Sounds sounds familiar, actually. Um, so, with our powers combined, uh, we have decided to tackle the issue of dinosaur video games today. Um, answer the, just sort of what, what games are out there and what problems kind of face dinosaur games. Um, so, uh, do you have any thoughts you want to start with? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I believe that this conversation sort of came up like you messaged me saying that there is a distinct lack of dinosaur games. Well, a distinct lack of good ones. Yeah. I mean, uh, and I, I believe I'll argue the point, like, in the grand scheme of things, if you compare to, like, good video games to bad video games... Uh, there's actually a fairly decent amount of good dinosaur games. All right. Uh, obviously, the first things that are going to come to mind, especially if people are familiar with me uh, talking with Dead Palad on Resident Evil, there is a very uh, famous survival horror game that features almost exclusively dinosaurs in Dino Crisis. Hmm. And that is the easiest way to put that game is it is Resident Evil with dinosaurs. Which I'm sure is probably pretty appealing to, to uh, some people out there. Uh, Resident Evil with dinosaurs. Um, they, haven't, uh, they haven't made any uh, Dino Crisis games in a long time though, right? No, they made uh, Dino Crisis 1 and 2. Then I believe they, uh, <coughs> excuse me, they did Dino Crisis 3. And that game did so badly that they have never revisited it since then. Oh, yikes. Uh, it, basically, the whole premise of that game was dinosaur, Resident Evil with dinosaurs in space. <laughs> which, I don't know how that fails, but it managed to do so quite spectacularly. Do you have any idea of whether the failure was down to it being a bad game? Or was it... <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Or was it a matter of bad marketing, or did just audiences didn't take to it, or? I believe it was just a. I, I've only vaguely remember renting it and playing it and not liking it, mm. and I think a lot of that was just because, uh, it was just it was a rushed game. And I, like honestly, the premise was good. I mean, flying a jetpack, fighting a dinosaur—that's pretty awesome in some circumstances but if, if the gameplay isn't fun then doesn't matter what your concept is it feels like you have to screw up really bad to make a concept like that not work yeah it's it's unfortunately that's how a lot of it, a lot of it goes you can have great concepts but if your execution's lacking it doesn't really matter hmm. so we can add so we can add dino crisis at least not the third one, um, to our list of uh, good dinosaur games. Any others that come to mind? 
Uh, another famous one is a uh, Turok Dinosaur Hunter. Uh, mm. that that was a first person shooter, and that's actually, I believe they just recently had a remake of the original one. I know there was a Turok game that came out in like two thousand nine, something like that. Two thousand eight. Yeah, it was. Uh, that's a series that honestly they did. Uh, they did Turok Dinosaur Hunter for the PC. Then I believe the second and third games were Nintendo sixty four exclusive. Then they just recently started revisiting it. Yeah, I actually remember playing um, that that one from a few years ago, and I mean I'm I'm certainly no you know video game expert. I I enjoyed it. Sort of. I never finished it. Um, I remember, if I had to look back on it, I guess overall the experience would be kind of meh. Um, yeah, it, it that was, it was an, I know at least with the original, that was an early first person shooter. And uh, that's when it started kind of going 3D. And unfortunately, when that started happening, that was an issue of, well... Um, what do we do with this? I guess we'll have platforming. That seems like it should work, right? Then next thing you know, you're you're ha you don't have depth perception despite it being 3D. So you're just kind of jumping and hoping you hit like this small hitbox that keeps you standing. Yeah. Well, thankfully things have come a long way since then, at least in terms of that. Yeah. So, so here's actually, I guess, maybe a, a more pertinent issue. Not necessarily, um, are there are there not as many good dinosaur games out there? But one, one maybe a better way to look at it would be, why don't we see more dinosaur games? Uh, because we, I mean, there are some, uh, I guess, for lack of a better word, monsters that have really taken off. In video games, probably the most obvious example uh, being zombies, but we've seen uh, there are there are certain genres and certain genre elements that seem to have really sort of taken off in the video game world. So there's lots of epic fantasies where you're fighting dragons and other fantasy creatures. You have plenty of zombie survival games, plenty of um, space uh, space marines uh, shooting aliens and robots. But we don't. They, I don't think we see it to the same extent with dinosaurs. No, and that is very true. Uh, and I think a lot of that might stem from uh, just kind of a lack of familiarity with like actual dinosaurs. Mm. Uh, most a lot of when dinosaurs are enemies, they're kind of usually regula regulated to these fast lizards with teeth that just run up to you and attack you. Yep. Yep, very true. Um, that's pretty, pretty much my experience with uh, dinosaurs in video games. Um, and I think, uh, personally, I, dinosaurs as monsters do not interest me. Uh, one, because it removes an element to dinosaurs that's really fascinating, which is the reality. Um, if you just boil dinosaurs down to monsters, you take away um, the thing that, to me, makes them really interesting, which is the fact that they are real animals. And the fact is, real animals don't just randomly you know, go up to people and just start clawing at them. I mean, unless they're rabid. But, um, and then the other reason is that, as far as monsters go, you could do better than dinosaurs. Right, uh, and that's the thing, and we do we do have those games where like, hey, every wolf out there is for some reason trying to kill you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's not just a dinosaur thing, but dinosaurs in particular typically are used like that. But again, as you said, they're they're animals. They don't necessarily they have motives for survival. And typically killing people, like, most animals don't just kill people for the sake of survival. Usually they have to be threatened and uh, put in a situation where they need, it's that, that hits that fight or flight. Yep. 
yeah, it's uh, it's very rare that animals attack people, and uh, you know, stranger still, it's very rare that predators attack people. Uh, if animals are ever attacking people, most of the time it's the big plant eaters. Um, predators are downright cowardly because um, they have to kill, so they want to put themselves in that situation uh, as little as they can. They have to basically fight for their life every time they want something to eat. So they don't go around attacking randomly because that's just they're, they're in that situation enough. That's their job. They don't want any more of that than they have to. Yeah, because why? Why would you if you get if you got what you need? Then what's the point of risking furthermore, or just a for what little gain? Right. I mean, exactly. I mean, I'm a person. I'm a person who barely wants to go to the grocery store because I have to deal with people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much, yeah. Um, so it's kind of ridiculous that the uh, lengths that dinosaurs, not only in video games, but in media in general, will go to for the sake of um, antagonizing people. So that's, a, that's another element that I don't think really works for, for dinosaurs in general, and video games are no different in that respect. Right, and, and that's not to discount dinosaurs as a possible enemy, because for all things, if you consider all things, they're so varied, they have different styles of like defense and attack that you can make a, a whole game based on dinosaurs and probably make it interesting. It's just they're they're without going through like an extent of maybe make it a backstory. Like all these dinosaurs went feral because of some kind of genetic programming. And that's, they were designed to like take over this Island for this evil guy. Like you could do, kind of a contrivance like that but if you really think about it some of the best the best villains are the ones that are actually malicious like they have a maybe not necessarily a motive but uh yesterday was uh alien day from like the alien trilogy oh uh, yeah and in a way that creature is designed to be sort of malicious like in my, like I'm not so familiar with like the the theory on how an alien's life works and stuff like that, but mm. the way they're just designed to like how they have to reproduce, uh, how they how their blood is super acidic, uh, all those are just kind of designs to make that enemy be oh well, regardless of why it's doing this, it's still a pretty malicious threat. It's, pardon the pun, it's also a predator. Mm -hmm. uh, where, whereas dinosaur, like animals, as we just got done saying, don't really have that. So why, if you're going to make an enemy, why not just take that, but add something to it to make it more of a, like an, like an actual interesting opposition towards your characters? Yes. So um, you either have to give dinosaurs a reason for wanting to attack you, um, or the other thing you do, and this is actually what Jurassic Park movies do, um, oftentimes the dinosaur isn't really the villain. The dinosaurs aren't actually the villains. There is some, there is some human character who um, has more malicious motives at work that the audience can kind of direct their um, venomosity towards. So that could also work for a video game where uh, the, the larger motivations that are antagonizing your player character, it's not necessarily the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs are more just an obstacle. They're there. They're a part of the world that you are in. But ultimately, you are putting, you're being set up against something more. Right. And that's, that's probably the best way to incorporate it. And I think a lot of games have at least the games I traditionally consider like good dinosaur games, uh, they've done that to at least some extent. Dinosaurs are typically more, uh, they're a threat. They still kind of do the thing where if they see you, they come after you. But they always try to be like, well, okay, it's not the dinosaurs you're after. They're just kind of the catalyst. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, another thing that I think can kind of offsuit the um, the, the sort of the crazy, you know, psycho predator motivation that a lot of 
dinosaur game pad is to kind of give the dinosaurs a bit more complex AI behavior. Um, so, for example, actually, uh, one dinosaur game I actually remember playing is uh, the, the video game adaptation of the King Kong remake from 2005. Huh. And there are some interesting things there where, yes, the dinosaurs are trying to kill and eat you, um, but you can actually do things like you can um, kill a smaller animal, uh, like put that on a spear, throw the spear, and the dinosaurs will actually go for that instead of going for you. And you can kind of use that to get away from them. That that's cool. That's very awesome. Yeah. So again, it's so again, it's it's an interesting element of gameplay, and it's also something that brings the dinosaurs closer to something resembling reality, where you know, a, they, you know, any predator is going to go for an easy meal over you know having to spend the energy to kill something. Yeah, especially I, why again? Why risk it? Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, but, um, so it, things like that, I think, can really make things you know both interesting and also more realistic. Right, and unfortunately, not a whole lot of games really go because, and this is not just for dinosaurs. A lot of times, games will have this issue where, okay, you know, we will give zombies a pass of, well, for some reason they're back to life, but they have no thought process, they're mindless, so that's why they go after you. But, uh, a good majority of the time, there's a lot of games where even humans, uh, like enemy soldiers and like a Call of Duty or uh, pr practically any game, people will just, for some reason, fight to the death. <laughs> uh, and I think that's something that we're seeing start to change. As, like you mentioned that one example. And I think that, that any time that is done is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's more interesting from a gameplay perspective and more interesting from a narrative <laughs> perspective. Exactly. Um, because it, it, I mean, this may not be the best word, but it humanizes, quote unquote, um, the, the enemy. They're not just some mindless um, AI, you know, program collection of pixels. You know, it's, it's, it's something that, you know, you can understand and relate to and that helps you to feel more immersed in whatever game you're playing. Right, and uh, this is this is kind of an offshoot example. I don't really, I play a lot in D and D, but I don't usually mention it on my channel. But anytime uh, a, you know, when you create an encounter in monsters, very rarely will the monster fight. You want it to fight to the death. It's easier to deal with that. But a lot of times when fights go bad for people, they'll retreat, and yeah. that usually makes it a far more interesting like personal decision like do we do i pursue do i stay back uh what if they're going to get back like it adds to like a complexity and a decision that the player has to make and i'm all for more player involvement i'm all for more player immersion yeah so that's that's those all really interesting points um so I, th I actually think that uh, pretty pretty much covers uh, the the role that dinosaurs can play in games as antagonists. Um, is there any anything else you want to add on that subject before we move, we move on to other things? Uh, no, I think we covered a, quite a bit of ground there, actually. Okay, cool, cool. So um, you know, one element that dinosaurs play in games, um, role they play in games, is as antagonizing forces that try to kill and eat you. But uh, there are other ways to use dinosaurs in games. Probably the, the one that pops most immediately to mind are the various uh, Zoo Tycoon games and their dinosaur expansions. So in this instance, uh, the dinosaurs really are just animals like any other, and you're putting them in a captive environment. You have to look after them. You have to care for them. Uh, make sure they're healthy, have enough food, have enough water, are in an environment that suits them. Um, and then hope that people like it. Yeah, or you, most likely people are going to sims it and be like, okay, what if I open the gate and close the, close the entrance? Let's see how many, let's see what happens. See, here's the thing. In the first two tycoon, that goes about as well as you would hope. Um, <laughs> and I love that these little, like, these little animations they do with the dinosaurs. The dinosaur just runs up to, you know, a helpless screaming person. There's this big dust cloud like from a cartoon. And then when the dust clears, dinosaurs still there, but there's no person. <laughs> um, 
But they didn't do that in the second one. In the second one, if you let, if you just, you know, close the, you know, take away the fence and seal off the end exit, the people will freak out. <laughs> but the dinosaurs don't really go for them. <laughs> Which is weird, because if you put, like, different dinosaurs in the same enclosure, they will fight to the death. Yeah, no, it's... I, th- I mean, that's the, that's a whole Sims thing. Like, you're gonna you're gonna mess around with that, yeah, <laughs> just to see what happens. But yeah, I'm sure the dust cloud was there because they didn't want to go above like a an E for everyone rating. Yeah, really. But uh, no, like that's a good point though. And those can actually uh, we haven't really seen too many of those recently. Mm. That was def that was definitely like the big thing in a Jurassic Park, uh, you know, the movie era. When they were uh, doing a whole lot of that, but uh, those actually have a lot of potential being educational. Yeah, um, one thing I remember looking at the sort of animal profiles in both Zoo Tycoon expansion, dinosaur expansions. Uh, they, to me, it was really clear that they had done their homework um, and they did lots of research to make sure everything was as uh, true to the science as is possible to be. Um, to some extent, you know, there's always nitpicking, but uh, generally they try to be accurate. Even going back to um, when the the second dinosaur expansion pack came out, probably in like 2008 or something, uh, most of the dinosaurs that should have been feathered were feathered. Um, you know, you can always, any you know dinosaur nerds can always say they want more feathers on them, but uh, at least it's an acknowledgement of the research going on at the time. And... And, you know, you kind of, again, you really need that to make the gameplay interesting. You, you need these to be animals that have uh, interesting and complex behaviors and needs that need to be met. Because if they're just, you know, mindless, then there's really, it's not fun to take care of them. Right. And especially if there's, even if, like, the whole requirement is, okay, well, we're going to, this dinosaur in particular needs an environment with two water one rock and three grass as opposed to like trying to build something that's a little bit more vague like okay well how much how much active water does it need how much resources does it need to like sustain itself and reproduce and stuff like that and that that can get more interesting uh and it, it's kind of hit or miss with a lot of those because i played some that have been really educational like you can click on you can click on the dinosaur with like a little question mark, and it'll tell you all about what they knew about the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then there's also some that are just like, okay, well it's gonna need at least a five by five pen with, you know, this, and then, okay here, and they just focus more on the money aspect, like, okay, well what dinosaurs attract the most visitors? And it's usually just a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yeah. Um... The Zoo Tycoon ones probably did a good job of balancing that. Um, the second one especially, uh, you had to work your way up to the big dinosaurs. You'd start out, you know, being able to take care of, like, you know, uh, Protar- Proto-Archaeopteryx and um, Velociraptor, and then you work your way up to, oh, now you can start taking care of, like, Tentrosaurus. Um, and then finally, you know, once you get a five-star rating in your zoo, then you can, then you can uh, have T-Rex. Right, and then, and that's when you would close the gate off. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can't get any more stars. I got all the dinosaurs. Let's see what happens. This this is what we've been building for. <laughs> this is what we've been building to this entire time. Uh, so, in addition to um, Zoo Tycoon, there was also another dinosaur park game that been, was kind of uh, well regarded. Was Jurassic Park Operation Genesis which was uh, basically Zoo Tycoon, but with Jurassic Park dinosaurs. Um, and that one, I unfortunately, I never really got to play that. Uh, but from what I can tell, it, it was uh, it was pretty fun. Yeah, and unfortunately, I never got to play it either, so I can't really speak to it. Uh, there's a lot of Jurassic Park games out there, though. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was... they, And they're still making them, uh, I believe... Uh, there's one in current development. That's what I've heard. Um, so here's the thing. When Jurassic World came out a couple years ago, 
there were actually plans to do a video game tie-in. Now, for whatever reason, Universal decided not to pursue that. Uh, however, there were uh, models made, animations done, and those did leak online eventually. But then people got cold feet and, and like took everything down. Uh, and I've heard rumors that now they are going forward, ooh, excuse me, going forward with that since the franchise is proving to be quite lucrative again. Right, where, where there's where there's money, there's going to be people making games for it. So, yeah. mm -hmm. definitely. Uh, and I believe the last one before that, the last big one, at least I remember. I don't really. There was probably like a bunch of mobile games, I'm sure, but yeah, uh, there was the Telltale one, which that obviously focused. That was an early Telltale game too. That was back when before they got really big with the Game of Thrones and yeah, uh, the Borderland one. Or The Walking Dead, even. That was like Back to the Future and Jurassic Park. And... Yeah, I played that. And let me put it this way. If you told me that, hey, this franchise that you love and has been an integral part of your life from an early age, that's been pretty much dead since 2001, is coming out with a brand new video game, that's going to have a brand new story with brand new characters. If you told me that something like that was coming out, and this was the game that came out, I, I not only would be quite disappointed, I in fact was disappointed. <laughs> um, it's you know I I really don't want to say the game is bad. It but... it was it was early Telltale. Like I honestly like the idea behind Telltale games. Because they're sort of reminiscent to like the old point and click adventure games, but yeah. they have like interesting like character decisions and stuff like that. But that was that was an early attempt at it. Yeah, definitely. And thankfully, I mean, thankfully they grew. Like I'm sure if they were to go back and try to redo it, they could probably do a lot better. But yeah, yeah, that's that's fair. Um, but again, it's just. If this was the big Jurassic Park game that we've been waiting for for a long time, you know, eh, could have done better. But who knows? Who knows what we'll get um, yeah. in the future? Yeah. Uh, uh, and if we're, we're going to talk Jurassic Park games, though, we can't not mention Trespasser. Trespasser. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm familiar with that one. Uh, Jurassic Park Lost World Trespasser. You never heard of that? Uh. I'm not familiar with, uh, like, the game? Yeah, because there no, was... No, I'm not... Apparently, this was, like, a, this is, like, pretty famous in the video game world. Apparently, it was supposed to be this big thing where, um, like, they, they had this grand idea where it was going to be... You're going to play as a character who had washed up on Isla Sorna after a plane crash, and you're on this island filled with dinosaurs, and you have to, you know, find your way to, like, um, like an old radio... Uh, building where you can you know call for help and not get eaten by dinosaurs along the way it was basically you know it was it was what we today would consider you know survival game where you know you're in this open world environment um, and dinosaurs are trying to kill and eat you so it's it has this really grand idea especially for 1997 um, but when it comes out it was apparently like really really buggy um, the graphics were nowhere near as good as they were making them out to be, and it was it was it was this great. It kind of held up as this like Titanic failure. That's a shame. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It seems like the Jurassic Park games have always been kind of hit and miss. Uh, there was an early, I believe, it was the first one uh, that they did on the Sega Genesis, mm -hmm. and they it was a movie tie-in because they. Still weren't even sure if the movie was going to be successful. Right. Uh, but I remember that one being fairly good. And that was the first game I re remember that you could actually play as a dinosaur. Because you have the choice between playing as Dr. Grant or a Velociraptor. <laughs> and and uh, as Grant, you're trying to like maneuver through all these dinosaurs. You have like a tranquilizer gun and you have to get by them. Oh, cool. But, and the whole, you know, you follow the a little bit of, vaguely the plot of the movie where you have to like go and finally make your way back up to the 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 big area to like get defeat the velociraptors to get off the island but if you play as the velociraptor you're like 
maneuvering through all these like humans with like stun guns and darts that try to take you down and the whole goal is again like grant you're getting off the island but you like sneak on a crate uh, and make your way to like a mainland oh wow that's actually kind of following like the plot of the novel actually that's interesting (laughs) Um, I think my brother actually had that game. My brother, who is significantly older than I am, he's like nine years older than I am. Um, I remember he had a Jurassic Park video game when I was, well, it's like three or four. Um, and it was kind of old by then. So it had to be, it could pretty much can only be that, actually, now that I think about it. Um, another Jurassic Park game that I remember playing is uh, Jurassic Park Warpath, which was a dinosaur fighting game where you uh, select one of a number of dinosaurs and you just fight another dinosaur in um, in uh, a, a set, a set piece from one of the two movies. There was two at that time, 1997. Um, and it was, it was a 3D fighter though. So you weren't just, it wasn't just like a, uh, like a Street Fighter or a Mortal Kombat situation. You were, you know, maneuvering around this open space trying to you know, kill a dinosaur. As a dinosaur. Uh, that seems like it would be a pretty pretty awesome concept. But I I can't imagine that game did all that well. I I'm guessing not either. Um but I remember playing it and I remember really enjoying it. Um there's only so much you can do with that. I mean there's only so many times you can fight a dinosaur in a row before it's like, eh, what's on TV? Um, but for what it was, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, and you know, you know there's nothing wrong with like even if it was, because uh, I'm looking at reviews here and it's kind of middling to bad. Mm. But uh, overall, like you can enjoy whatever game you want. That's obviously when we're younger, that's easier to do because we don't necessarily have like a a set definition of okay well this is what constitutes a good game versus a bad one Mm -hmm. Uh, same thing with movies you know by that point they're still kind of a novelty in and of themselves right and as we get older we kind of lose we kind of lose we get jaded we lose that sort of i wouldn't not nostalgia goggles but like this veil over eyes that doesn't allow us to see like flaws and such and and, that, and that's sometimes hard, but to like put aside now, like oh no, what I enjoyed this game when I was little, uh, and sometimes you can pick up a game you enjoyed when you're little and still play it and have fun with it, regardless. Like yeah, I know this is a bad game, but yeah, um, yeah, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, a lot of Jurassic Park games have been kind of hit or miss. I know there was. A few on uh, like the CD where it was like, okay, well, the Sega CD where you can like, oh, let's let's go explore the park, and uh, I believe that there was there was quite a few different games. I actually two that I or one that I played when I was a kid, like eight or so or nine, was basically it was a, a board game on the PC. Uh, it was a Jurassic Park three tie-in. And basically, um, the goal was you were supposed to be collecting dinosaur DNA to clone your own dinosaur. But it was a board game. It'd be like, um, you know, there were cards. You, If you land on a card space, you pick up a card and, you know, go to this spot to collect this. And, you know, and there were points and um, things like that. It was, it was really fun. And But here's the thing. I forgot, actually. There was another big Jurassic Park game that came out. Um, between now and when the Telltale game ca- came out, and that's Lego Jurassic World. I was just I was just looking at that actually, yeah. and I actually did play Lego Jurassic World. And here's the thing: Lego games are always I mean Lego games are Lego games. They're yeah you know, they're not quite like anything else. And this was pretty much a giant send up of the entire franchise. So like if you're me. And you're, you know, a long-time watcher of these movies. And yeah, I know 2 and 3 really suck and 4 is kind of middling. But I still really enjoy them. They're, you know, I can't not enjoy dinosaurs killing and eating people. <laughs> and they were, those two movies were a big part of me growing up. So it was really fun to um, 
to explore these these islands on on your own and make dinosaurs and play as dinosaurs and and that, it was a, it was a lot of fun. It was great. It was yeah, Lego, it was Lego Jurassic Park. In yeah, everything I mean, that you would expect from that. You you have to concede that's a Lego game, but the Lego games are actually really well done. Mm-hmm. Uh, that I mean, they kind of follow a formula, but uh, it's been a formula that's been really good. And obviously, they're more designed for like a younger audience. But uh, as far as like an audience or a game designed for that audience, they still do a lot of solid gameplay and good work with it. They really do. They really do. And uh, shout out also to Lego Dimensions for basically um, reading some of my fan fiction online <laughs> and basically deciding to make a game out of that. I mean, I'm not joking. I Somewhere out there in the deepest, darkest depths of the internet, I do have stories posted that have like Gandalf and Batman and dinosaurs all in the same story. So, um, thanks a lot. You, you are, you're very, you realize you're, you're brave for admitting that because there's going to be someone who's sca- right now probably scouring the internet and be like, I want to find it. Go ahead. It's, it's unfinished. <laughs> and I mean, to be honest, I still kind of, I still have ideas for stories like that every once in a while. But, but anyway. Um, so, uh, in terms like all right, so Jurassic Park seems to be one of the ones that are still kind of keeping dinosaur games alive. Uh, but is there like outside of Jurassic Park, is there any games out there that's still trying to do stuff with dinosaurs that you know of? I'm glad you asked. Um, there are two actually currently in. The, there's actually a fair few in development out there. But there's two that I want to give special um, props to. Uh, one is called Prehistoric Kingdom, and it is another park builder game. Uh, but this one is, first of all, it's going to be just prehistoric animals. So instead of prehistoric animals being more of a side thing, they're going to be the focus here. And uh, in it, they are really going the extra mile in terms of making sure that uh, the animals look the way they're supposed to. Um, they're make sure, making sure to do all the research to make sure the animals look both aesthetically pleasing and as scientifically credible as they can be. And also um, having a very large selection of animals. So in addition to having all the well-known ones, you've got your T-Rex, your Triceratops, your Brontosaurus, etc. There's also going to be lots of obscure dinosaurs, um, as well as creatures that lived um, at the same time as dinosaurs but weren't dinosaurs, so like pterosaurs, marine reptiles, things like that. Uh, lots of Paleozoic creatures, so um, big fish, stem mammals, uh, giant amphibians, as well as creatures that lived after the um, dinosaurs, the non-bird dinosaurs, that is. So um, lots of um, Cenozoic mammals, um, uh, in addition to like mammoths and saber-toothed cats, again, there will be obscure ones that people aren't as familiar with. So it really is the park builder game for dinosaur lovers and prehistory lovers. Um, so I, that one is still... Um, well into development at this point. Um, most of what their material is at this point is lots of beautiful looking concept art as well as occasional uh, videos of their development basically saying um, like here's what we've done so far with that concept art. There really isn't a whole lot. I don't think, I think there's a very old demo that's available but that's really not reflective of what the game is going to be so I wouldn't bother with that really unless you're really bored. Um, but apart from that, that one's still got a ways to go. But it's looking great so far, and I, I I cannot wait for to see the finished product. Yeah, I'm looking at the development blog right now, and they got a lot of stuff still on there. Uh, last update was January 21st, but it was a pretty substantial update, it looks like. Yeah, they have they their development moves kind of slow, but at the same time, they're totally independent. Um, and as far as I know, this is people just working in their free time. Uh, so this is to be expected. And from considering that, uh, that this pace is to be expected. And the content they're producing is no less spectacular. Right. Uh, and that's the one thing that's really nice. Like, yeah, it's a give and take with indie development uh, because you're working on their schedule. And a lot of these people have full-time jobs. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, 
if they're not freelancing for like other companies they're also having to you know they're probably working day jobs and trying to fit that in and uh programming and building assets and all that takes a lot of time uh it does. Yeah. It's, especially now because game development has kind of gotten so big over the course of like the past 20 years uh for a game early, an early super nintendo game a big game would only take about a year to develop nowadays like even a small game if you're using 3d assets and trying to do like something original with it if you're looking anywhere from three to four years just in development and that's and it's an unfortunate fact but we haven't really come up with technology to make development easier like we can't just tell like if you're like yeah make me a dinosaur <laughs> like no you're having a if you're ha even going through and doing all the research on yourself like just okay well what would this look like how exactly do I model this? And uh, you, you of all people, are well aware of how much of this information is constantly changing. So, oh boy, yes. <laughs> by the time you, by the time you start on it and you get one developed, three years later you're looking at that and be like, that's not as that's not what it is anymore. <laughs> three years later, if you're lucky. If not, three months later. <laughs> um, yeah, it's. It's really tough, and so I always give I always give tremendous credit to, to people who try. Um, that's the thing is I can always tell when somebody's tried. I know when somebody has really tried to be make sure everything is as credible as possible, even if they don't get everything right, even if there are still errors, even if there are still glaring errors, I'll still know that they tried. On the other hand, I'll also know if your extent of dinosaur knowledge is watching Jurassic Park. <laughs> Um, and indeed, there are a lot of things out there where it's very clear that's the case. Um, but no, yes, I. It always really excites me when when um, both the the talent, the skill, the artistic um, power of these people is combined with the research and the science. That always makes for great art of any kind. And this is a great segue into the other game that's currently in development is much farther along and will hopefully be coming out sometime in the next couple months and that is Saurian which is a very different type of game it's a dinosaur survival game only you're actually playing as a dinosaur um, Saurian is basically a video game reconstruction of an environment called the Hell Creek um, held based on the Hell Creek formation uh, of South Dakota so it's recreating an entire paleo ecosystem uh, all the way down to the most minute details, everything, the plants, the weather, um, the environment, like the mountains, the ocean, uh, the landscape, the and of course the animals are all based very heavily on the most up-to-date research. Um, if you go to their website, uh, SaurianGame.com, uh, you can see they you know the research they put into it they have a whole page describing the environment what kind of world you'll be playing in uh, when they first announced this game several years ago about probably about four years ago at this point if not more uh they were you had the option to play as four dinosaurs the dinosaurs were triceratops t-rex pachycephalosaurus and at the time acroraptor which was actually uh, had not actually been scientifically announced yet when they started development. Uh, that changed uh, in October of 2015. A new dinosaur was discovered called Dakota Raptor, which is um, much larger than Acro Raptor. It's about the size of your typical Jurassic Park Raptor, although covered in feathers, of course. And that is now the uh, other playable dinosaur. After they launched their Kickstarter campaign in May of 2016, they were able to add a lot of uh, wonderful new features to the game that they uh, were kind of dubious about before. So everything from uh, customizable dinosaurs, you'll be able to customize the individual appearance of your dinosaur based on actual individual variation that we see in the fossil record. Um, you'll be able to have the options to play as, say, an albino animal or a leucistic animal um, or a melanistic animal. And this will actually impact uh, how hard the game is for you because 
In real life, albino animals are often at a disadvantage. It's often harder for them to survive, and that will also be the case if you choose to play as an albino creature in Saurian. Um, and probably one of the most exciting things they were able to get uh, from their Kickstarter campaign is they were able to add two other dinosaurs. So they were able to add uh, the armored dinosaur and Kylosaurus with the big club on the end of its tail. And they were also able to add the large uh, Hell Creek Oviraptorosaur Anzu, uh, which is a large, very, very bird-like dinosaur. Um, it looks like a large chicken or turkey. Uh, and they have already said that this dinosaur will actually have the ability in game to mimic the sounds made by other dinosaurs, which is something that a lot of birds can do today. If you've ever seen that video of uh, the lyre bird imitating a chainsaw, yeah, uh, I, was, I was thinking just that one. Yeah, so that'll be that'll be really fun. Um, and probably one of another uh, aspect they were able to add to the game that's really interesting to me is something called post impact survival because the rock formation that they are basing this game on is the very, very uh, topmost layer. So the one that's most recent in time and the one that would have experienced the KPG mass extinction event. So this will actually be a part of the game where after playing for a certain amount of time, uh, the, the meteor will hit and it will be up to you to try to survive in a world of, increasing, of increasingly of no of rapidly decreasing resources so uh, you know water will become more scarce if you're a plant eater it will be harder to find food if you're a meat eater um, it might be harder it will actually if you're a meat eater it will be great at first because all the plant eaters will die uh, but once you eat everything then you have to start eating each other um, so that will that will be really interesting and it's been phenomenal to see the success of the game even so far because um, like I said, they originally started this uh, game back in like probably November of 2012. And everything they had produced up to the point of their Kickstarter was done in their free time. So if you go to their website and you watch their Kickstarter video, just remember that's what they made when they were just doing it in their spare time. And now that they have their Kickstarter was phenomenally successful, they have a lot more resources and time to devote to the game. They have bi, uh, not bi-weekly, so not twice a week, but once every other week. They have an update just to show you what's going on. And uh, hope, like I said, hopefully that will be some out sometime <coughs> in the next couple months. And to just get an idea of how rigorous the research has been on this, uh, they do credit several paleontologists uh, on their website, people who I actually know so I can verify that they really know their stuff and they know what they're doing. And they will have actually said that this, this may very well be the first video game to ever have a work cited page. <laughs> and in addition to that, they're also coming out with um, a book called, um, I think it's called Hell Creek, The World of Saurian, which will double as both um, a field guide uh, to the Hell Creek fauna, as well as an art book for the development of the game. Yeah, I was looking at they. They've been showing a little bit of that on their blog, mm -hmm. uh, and I just think that's amazingly awesome because I am all for a game that can be like used as both a teaching tool and something that can be very interesting and fun to play. And the way that and that and some a lot of times combining the two is very difficult, like. Uh, a very early example that people can relate to is Oregon Trail. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that game, like that game, can be rough around the edges. But that was like the first edutainment game that was like, okay, well, we're gonna try to make a game and make an educational tool. And in some cases, it does. Like, I didn't know. In fact, I think the only information I have ever learned about the Oregon Trail is been from the game <laughs> because the teacher was just like, well. We're going to talk about the Oregon Trail, so play a game so I don't have to do anything. Yeah, really. Uh, but and a lot of times one can easily overclips the other. Mm -hmm. uh, like if you make it too educational, it, eventually it's like, well, now am I taking tests in between doing like quest? Right. Yeah. Or, or if you make it too fun, like, okay, well, what do you drop in terms of 
a unintuitive mechanic because it's more realistic versus what do you make fun, but maybe not make it as realistic. Yes, that that's a very fine balance that any form of media has to take if they're trying to portray something in, in a more realistic light. And one thing I really have to give props to Sorian for is their dedication to finding that balance. Uh, because one thing they have said up front is that they are un completely uncompromising with regards to anything that's like an established fact. Like people have asked them, you know, hey, well, we have the option to play as a non-feathered Tyrannosaur. And they're like, no, because that completely defeats the point of the game. Um, so they've been, you know, having to struggle. But they've they've had the struggle of trying to balance, you know, fun gameplay and um, realistic uh, science. And so far, they've been doing a fantastic job of that. Instead of looking at reality as a hurdle, as an obstacle, instead they're looking at it as an opportunity, uh, as a chance to say, okay, how can we incorporate this into the game and have it be a part of the experience? I'm trying to think of like a particularly good example. Really, the whole game is a damn example. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, okay, no, here's a great example. Here's a great example. Animal dinosaurs in particular, this is true of all animals, but dinosaurs in particular, um, especially meat eaters, example something that we are an example of something that we call niche partitioning. Uh, this means that they, when the young hatch, they are very different from their parents. Uh, they look different, and they fulfill a different ecological niche. So, uh, young tyrannosaurs are doing things different from the adults. If you look at, like, say, you know, a juvenile Tyrannosaurus versus an adult Tyrannosaurus, they look very different. The juvenile is much more gracile, much more lightly built, uh, has much longer legs, and is much faster. And is going to be eating things like, uh, you know, small animals, small mammals, reptiles, uh, things like that. Versus if you look at the adult, it's much more heavily built, much more powerful, much more muscular, and it's, it's going after big dinosaurs. So this is going to be a part of the gameplay. If you decide to play as T-Rex, you're going to have to navigate your ecology. You have to sort of um, look at how you are growing and determine what creatures are the best prey options for you that you'll be able to hunt and eat and survive. Yeah, and, that, and that's awesome. I And that... It looks like it's coming along fairly well in development. So, as you, I think you mentioned, it should be uh, at least early access release in the next couple of months. Yes, their their ultimate goal is early access for quarter two. Um, their original, they did originally promise, or not, I shouldn't say promise, but they originally um, set it as quarter one for early access. That ended up not happening. Um, but again, they've never. I mean, they've tried their hardest not to set a set date. Um, for the longest time, if you ask them, you know, when's it coming out, when's it coming out, they'd always say, we just don't know yet, we're not far enough in development to give you um, a time frame. So the fact that they've even narrowed it down to quarters is actually very encouraging uh, to me. So I, I do anticipate we'll be seeing something from them uh, relatively soon, and I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, and I'm looking at the Kickstarter. They, that was a pretty successful Kickstarter, all things considered. Uh, they unlock, they unlocked even multiplayer and VR support with that. Yes, I, I remember when the Kickstarter launched, you know, I don't think anybody, certainly they didn't even know what the interest level in this was. They didn't, they didn't know how successful this was going to be, if it was going to be successful at all. So when I looked at their stretch goals, I was like, eh, let's focus, let's just focus on getting that first goal met. Um, but just w within the first couple days, stretch goals were being met. And by the time they reached multiplayer, I was like, oh, my God, this the interest and the demand for this is exceedingly higher than I would have thought. And that that honestly melts my heart as someone who loves dinosaurs and really sees something like this as an opportunity to really get people both caught up with the current science as well as to get them really interested in it. Um, it's absolutely heartwarming to see this level of enthusiasm for a project like this. Well, that, yeah, and there's not been a game like this that I can think of. There's been 
there's been survival games uh, that have kind of like the closest one I can think of is there was a game developed by I forget it was like it was a government funded game and it's called Wolf Quest hmm. where you where you basically play as a wolf and you have to go out and find a mate then have kids and raise the kids uh, and I'm giving that game a lot of credit considering if you were to compare the two uh, between Sorian and Wolf Quest, Wolf Quest is not a great game. <laughs> uh, but I mean, it, it was a game that was close to, but like concepts of, oh, you're just going to play as a animal in an ecological system. Uh, we don't see that. That's not something you traditionally find in too many games. No, and that's because, um, you know, most people who are working in, in games don't necessarily have a whole lot of biology or zoology background. And if you were to ask, you know, your, you know, just pull your average gamer or game developer off the street and say, hey, how would you like to play as a perfectly normal animal in a perfectly normal setting where your only goal is to survive? If, you know, going off the sort of basic knowledge, it's probably not going to sound very interesting. But the more you know about animals and about ecology, the more you realize that, no, there's a lot of complexity here. There's a lot of different things that you have to navigate and to work out. And that can make for some really interesting gameplay. So a game like this really couldn't have been made by anyone other than a bunch of dinosaur nerds. Exactly. And I'm really glad they're Kickstart because... Uh, that allows them to like focus on making what they want to make. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with going through a lot of the publishers is you can get funding that way, but a lot of times you're also having to sacrificing your creative freedoms because the publisher will be like, well, we want the option for you to play as a human surviving the dinosaurs. Yeah. And, um, you know, whereas that can be interesting, that's not the vision they want to go for. Yes, no, definitely. And, and, you know, if they went through any major uh, distributor or publisher, I guarantee you they would push to have at least some of the dinosaurs unfeathered because we have seen this even from documentaries. We have seen pressure to defeather or underfeather dinosaurs because they don't think people will like them. Even though this is a documentary and this is something that's supposed to be factual, um, <laughs> That there's still that pressure, so um, that it's to me it's it's great that they've been able to keep that focus on. Nope, we are not deviating from uh, reality. If if it's an established, well-supported, rigorous um, reality, and if it, if anyone's out there who's thinking that like um, limiting it to what is known from the fossil record will somehow limit the creativity, I assure you. <laughs> That's not an issue. That's not a problem. Um, although we do know a lot about dinosaurs from the fossil record, there's still a shit ton we don't know. And that leaves the door open to a lot of interesting speculation. Uh, speculation is, a, is at the heart of paleo reconstruction, and good paleo artists know this, and they embrace it. Um, and, and if I may butt in, just speaking from a game design aspect, it is important to limit yourself. Like, mm -hmm. yes. if you if you are like anyone out there who is designing a game and they don't put even artificial limits on themselves, like, okay, well, I want to make an RPG. All right, that's fine. If you want to make an RPG, that's great. I highly recommend anyone out there that was interested, go do that. But if you just don't put a limit at yourself and like, okay, well, there's not going to be a limit on, like, the technology. We're going to have anywhere from, like, stone axes to like futuristic laser rifles and <laughs> we're gonna have medieval culture mixed in with feudal japan culture and we're gonna go ahead and have 30 different races and <laughs> 20 20 different classes and you eventually you get this thing where it just becomes unmanageable mm -hmm. because every piece you add to it you're having to balance that piece with every other piece out there yeah, and this is important not only for video games. I believe this is a fundamental part of all art, is the setting of boundaries and limits. And on the surface of it, you think, what limits on art? 
that can't be good because artists should be free to do whatever they want. It's like, yes, but um, doing anything is not the same as doing everything. Um, uh, chances are imposing limits actually has a number of benefits. Number one, if you drop somebody out into the middle of a vast like wilderness that's just flat land with no trees as far as the eye can see, is that person going to wander very far? No, 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 the... they're not because they don't. They have no reference point. They don't know how. They, I mean, they're pretty much already lost. Right. Um, it's the same thing with art. If, if you can do whatever you want, you'll ultimately find you don't end up being very creative because you stick to what's safe and what you know. Imposing limits gives you a boundary to explore. It means you know. It means there's a set space that you can explore things and try to you know be creative. You know, it, it limits actually force you to be creative. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And with with this, like taking it back to this project, focusing on just a certain time and a certain place allows them to exhaust everything they can use with that certain time and place. Yes, absolutely. Um, and thank. I mean, there's a reason they picked this time and this place. I mean, not only does it have T Rex and Triceratops, which are pretty much like the two favorite dinosaurs. But it's also one of the most well-known groups of rocks out there on dinosaurs. Uh, if they were to make a follow-up game, which, God willing, they will, um, it, the follow-up will probably there's I can already see it. There's two places this follow-up game can be for. One is going to be the Morrison Formation, which is a group of late Jurassic rocks from the Midwest U.S., and that is sort of the environment where we see Brontosaurus, Stegosaurus. Uh, Allosaurus, so it's the same thing where it's got a lot of very well-known dinosaurs, as well as a lot of other creatures that are new and interesting and, you know, great fun with. And the other place they might potentially set it, because again, it's very well-known, we have a lot of fossils from this, we have a lot of data on this environment, is the Yizian Formation from the Liaoning province of China. And I probably didn't pronounce any of those words correctly, <laughs> uh, including China. Um, but <laughs> that again, it's another a very well-known paleo environment and this is home to a, a lot of the feathered dinosaurs that are starting to come out creatures like um, Microraptor and uh, those types of dinosaurs it would be very different game if they said it in that environment but hey nothing wrong with different they just have to do what they did here which is to adapt the gameplay to the environment in the most interesting and fun way possible right and that's entirely possible because if they're designing this engine like they built the engine around this uh it probably wouldn't be a hard stretch to imagine that they could take assets from one and throw it into the other and make changes to it. Not at all, uh, because at the end of the day, um, the animals are players in the same game, which is the game of life, the game of survival. So the goals for all the animals, no matter what environment they do it in, are the same. Eat, fuck, and, you know... At babies, so you know it would be a simple matter of you know just taking the same engine, applying it to a different environment, and then tweaking it for you know any individual behaviors, any individual quirks that different species might have. Yeah, and like it looked like they had plan. Like I'm looking at the Kickstarter uh, again, and they were had a 300 k goal, which they didn't quite meet uh, for some that's. Like it was a new map, new formation, new ecosystem. Yep. And so, so they definitely have plans. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was for what we call the Two Medicine Formation, which is a group of Canadian rocks that are slightly younger, uh, but are very similar. So basically, uh, the models would just be slightly different. Uh, you you would have things like Styracosaurus instead of um, Triceratops. You probably have something like Gorgosaurus instead of T Rex. Uh, but yeah, ultimately not not quite enough for that. But, you know, there's no knowing how successful the game will be or right. won't be when it comes out. I mean, I'm not going to, don't want to jinx it. Um, so who knows what they'll be able to do and what they'll be able to expand upon. I, honestly, I, like, this is going off my, like, player intuition, like, as a game player. Uh, I can kind of see this game doing well because survival games are still very hot. Uh, there's, there's a ton of them out there, but a lot of them fall under two categories. They're either zombie survival 
or their island survival. Hmm. Like, uh, Minecraft really kind of took that ser- like that whole genre off, but it's still going strong. If if they're releasing as even within this year, I think they might catch it. Plus, it's so different from what everyone else has been doing. Uh, like people like different things. Like they they don't like necessarily completely new things, but if someone's like, no, this is a survival game with dinosaurs. That would be. I think that would be enough to at least get some people. Depending on how they price it, I think I read somewhere that it was. They weren't wanting a whole lot for it. It was like a twenty dollar asking price. Yeah, actually, that that sounds about right. So, like, if you donated to the Kickstarter, I think it was something in that neighborhood where you you get the game if you donated like twenty dollars to Kickstarter. Yeah, I, actually, it was fifteen dollars for the digital copy of the game. Uh, twenty dollars got you the soundtrack. So, and obviously that was like an early Kickstarter. If the, even twenty, that's that's not a bad price to like jump into something. No, and it's actually it's also really encouraging to hear you say that because a lot of the discussion I've had about Sorin has been with people on the paleo side of things, and it's like, well, duh, we're excited for the game, <laughs> but what do other people think? You know, I kind of want to get another an outsider's perspective. You know, something who doesn't have as much invested in this. Um, this thing, uh, you know, what do non-dinosaur nerds think of it? And to hear that there are, you know, people who, you know, not as much into dinosaurs as we are, still interested in the game. That's really, really good to hear. Yeah, no, I, it, I mean, obviously there are things that could, you know, marketing is a big issue. Like people need to know it exists. Mm-hmm. Uh, and hopefully, with the way Steam has been talking about changing their algorithms to, sh- like tell people more about the games that they might enjoy and not flood it so much with like crappy early access games uh to be like no this game has potential uh the fact that it was successfully kickstart alone speaks volumes that i think there's going to be an audience because uh typically if you look at kickstarters uh i forget the exact uh the exact statistic that someone said but it's like for every one backer on Kickstarter, there's at least four people who want to play the game. Right, that's true. And there were a lot of backers. Um, to just give people an idea, their original goal for this game was 50000 and they made over four times that much. Yeah, uh, 6,500 backers or, or over that amount. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I definitely see this as a potential... I I wasn't familiar with this game at all until you first told me about it, and I'm looking at it. It's I'm excited for it. I'm definitely gonna play it when it uh, releases. You're gonna have to do a video on your channel, and then have me on for it when it comes out. Um, I don't think the uh, the multiplayer will be out by then, but nonetheless, we'll have a lot to talk about. Yeah, no, I'm definitely excited for it, and I I mean I think that's a good one to end off on because. Uh, despite, you know, despite the Dino Crisis and Turok's not really being in our world anymore, that it's a good pro- it's a good perspective of what's got to come between Prehistoric Kingdom, uh, Saurian, and whatever uh, Jurassic Park decides to do. Yeah, and this is really great, especially for the video game world, because one thing that really frustrates me um, as an educator is the fact that right now, people's meter by which they view... Uh, prehistory has pretty much been Jurassic Park for a long time. And that's what frustrates me. It's not that Jurassic Park gets things wrong. I mean, there's tons of movies and books and shit out there that get things wrong. The problem is that people look at that as their meter by which they measure everything else. Um, So I have no problem with Jurassic World coming out and making their own game and using their old lizardy, featherless raptors and whatever. As long as we have things like Saurian and Prehistoric Kingdom um, that act as those ne- very necessary um, sort of wake-up calls for a lot of people. Right. And, I mean, that could be – it could be a thing where one builds off another. Like someone plays Saurian. Uh, and you, you see this. If you look at uh, – if you really look into, like, the trending games and seeing how each thing kind of builds off another, Saurian could come out. That could help spur sales for – uh, prehistoric kingdoms, then 
or Jurassic the Dress World game could come out and people like it, but they wanted something more. Uh, and so, you know, Sorian comes out. It it can all build off each other. Yeah, I mean, here's hoping. Here's hoping this will be the genesis of a new uh, trend in prehistoric animal games. One that will hopefully um, run its course and not overstay its welcome. <laughs> We're looking at you, zombie games. <laughs> Uh, dinosaur zombies. That's that's what we need. I mean, I mean, I, I could like you joked. It could end there. I yeah, really. But anyway, like you said, I think that's a good note to end off on. Nice little uh, end on a nice optimistic note. So um, thank you for joining me this evening, Mr. Dwarf. Not a problem. I enjoyed it. All right. So um, remember to check out uh, the Sober Dwarf show. Yep. Or- that. Uh, you can, if you're on YouTube, you can just type in Soberdorf. I'm the first one that comes up, thankfully. Uh, there are no other non un, un, uh, inebriated. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, all the, other, the, all the other dwarfs on YouTube are drunk off their ass right now. Uh, and if you are interested, uh, I my most popular video is a video on Dark Souls and how the difficulty of games uh, – how you design a game to be difficult, but in a way that's fun and encouraging for people to play rather than discouraging. Uh, but if I've actually been getting a lot of people saying good things about my most recent video on taboo. So if you are interested in, if a video game can tell the future, uh, that is definitely one to check out. What do you mean, if a video game can tell the future? Of course, a video <laughs> game can tell the future. Um, all right, so on that note, thank you for joining me. Uh, thank you all for listening, and have a wonderful afternoon. Everyone take care. <laughs>